So now we are moving from retro uh, compute, computing to the cutting edge of creating visual effects for the AAA games. We have Johannes Richter here <laughs> from Remedy, and I'll let you take away. Uh, yeah, hello everyone and good afternoon. I'm uh, very grateful to be here and talk a little bit about our work uh, that we do at Remedy. Um, just to quickly introduce myself, my name is Johannes Richter. I'm the head of VFX at Remedy. My background is film stuff. I worked in, in, in London for many, many years and then I moved uh, to Helsinki three and a half years ago. And now I'm, I'm working on, well, the projects we are doing there and looking after the VFX and tech art team. Uh, what I want to talk about today is well, Control the Foundation, which is uh, one of the DLCs for Control. Um, some ideas and concepts that we try to realize there and how we designed and approached this whole thing, visual development, some examples from the actual production, and then something about Houdini use. Uh, it's a bit focused around the concept of proceduralism and what do we learn from that and what do we want to apply in the future. Now, Control, some of you have might heard of it, um, is a, a third-person action adventure. Jesse Faden, the oldest house, supernatural stuff going down, um, and uh, maybe known in some circles for the destruction that we did in that. There was a talk uh, a few years back uh, we did about the uh, erective environments in this, um, if you want to sort of follow up on that kind of stuff. The foundation basically builds uh, on top of that, that is sort of extending um, sort of the game world a bit. It's uh, the first DLC um, that's now part of the Ultimate Edition. I think it comes all as one package now. And Jesse is on a mission to the basement, to the foundation of the oldest house, to avert it, just another threat around the hiss. And the challenge there, of course, it's a DLC, but you, know, you don't curb your enthusiasm or lower your ambitions there. You want a new location, you want new abilities, you want sort of great fun gameplay for the, for the players. You enjoy a bit more of this wonderful world but it has to fit into whatever is already there. Uh, the technology is quite locked. You can't start inventing entirely new things. The project team is always small, and you only have a very short amount of time, about four months that we had to get this done. And it was overlapping, of course, with other things that were still happening on uh, the control sort of production track, like the Expedition DLC that we did in between. Now, some ideas we had uh, as as part of this is like, you know, how do we extend this? What do we want to do? And there was uh, conversations about the duality of can we like grow something and destroy something as two abilities. Um, it had to be kind of limited to this foundation sector when you do that because you can't just start growing things everywhere else because then you've got to redo all the gameplay and design there to make sure that people can't get to where they shouldn't get to um, if you add those kind of things. Uh, and we talked about some kind of crystalline material um, and based on that, we quite quickly went into doing some very simple exploration. So they're by no means polished. It's more like, what could we do there? How could that look like? How could that feel? So we have Jesse here uh, pulling something out of the wall and then different variations of this, what they could be. So that's really, how can we make big environmental changes with an ability like that? Um, then we looked at how can we use those crystals as weapons, you know, things that shoot out of the ground and spike your enemies that you've just lured to the right spot. Um, we looked at traversal, what kind of things, mechanisms could we have for the player to use this material and maybe an ability around that to sort of get to places where they wouldn't without that ability. Um, make it a door, for example, or um, it's kind of a different kind of door. And um, those were mainly inspirations of like what could we do there, but it gave us a good um, sort of an idea of what we might be wanting to do. Uh, so we had ideas of what the crystals could be, uh, supporting, so something that player learns to create and destroy in separate stages, so we could have some kind of Metroidvania style, so you can't get to every place straight away, you need to gain this ability to then get later on get back to it. The power fantasy, how do we... The control is about throwing stuff at things, right? You can pick up, uh, launch bits of the environment at your enemies, and it is this power fantasy, um, so the player should still feel empowered also with those new abilities, being able to manipulate the surroundings. Um, it had to be part of traversal, we wanted player guidance, um, so if, you know, you see crystals, you're like, hey, that's the thing I need to go to, something will be happening there. And of course, gating, so blocking them from proceeding. Um, and part of combat, we saw the spikes. And part of puzzles, it never ends, right? Um, later we called them rituals. Um, and of course, 
because they're in this kind of cave-ish basement area, they're environmentally present, as if they just sort of live there. That's where they occur, naturally. That's a material of that foundation. So very early on, excuse the frame rate, but that's just really a, a, the, the capture that I gobbled there, I think, uh, when I took this video. That was the very first test. You step on the yellow thing, this, this box starts growing, and uh, it can stop at any time, and you can go in and sort of smash it into bits, and I think then you can step on this red, and then it resets everything. So that was really the very first something in engine that does kind of what we wanted um, in a test level with weird other stuff in. Um, and uh, kind of worked. We're like, OK, they could maybe do the thing. So how could the system actually look like? So if we think of what is a crystal, we have something that is on the wall. What can you do with it? So we wanted to maybe grow out. So there needs to be an animation of the crystal growing. There needs to be the thing itself, like once it's there. There needs to be a state that tells us, hey, it might just be breaking soon, maybe because you're shooting it or because they're decaying on their own. Um, and then they need to be breakable. And then um, if you put all this into the game, then this is kind of how that looks like. We saw the, the state on the wall. We see it growing out. Um, and then you can also ju already jump in those places um, and use this to get around in the game world. Um, and I'm not sure if it's in this video, but uh, they, of course, then at some point start to crumble and break, and then you're back to the initial state of like just having this um, element. Yeah, there, there you go, this element on the wall. And of course, they kind of come in two flavors. They're made out of the same part. That's the growing thing. Like you have sort of nothing there. You pull on it, comes, you know, lives for a while, crumbles, breaks, and is back to the thing on the wall. But you could do the other way around as well. You have a crystal that's already there. You shoot it, you sort of uh, yeah, have a go at it, it crumbles, it breaks, then you have this nothing, <laughs> um, you know, this little latchy item on the wall, uh, and then it just grows back and is back into its original state. And these are the two core things every crystal uh, uh, in this game basically can do or is kind of made of. These are all the parts. Essentially, they're actually the same parts. It's just you flop them around and then you get a different type of behavior. And that's essentially grow and destroy in there already. And um, the procedural flow idea behind it, I mean, what is proceduralism, right? So it's sort of a rule-based thing. You have something, you apply rule-based operations on it, and then you have something else. Um, for us, uh, we wanted to use it because we had to make a lot of dis different crystal elements very quickly or with a good, good level of control without having to model every single one of them, etc. cetera. Um, so the idea was to provide the base shape. That's like when you look uh, like head-on, that's kind of what you see up here. And then a top-down and a side view, what roughly the shape would be. And uh, based on that, we would be generating, well, an FBX that looks like a crystal. That's all done in Houdini. Uh, well, FBX is just the format of choice, a 3D object. Then you have a, a 3D object for the core element. There's a little secret 3D object in there, because when you're trying to pull something out of the wall, you get a little highlight that shows you that you can actually pull on it. And that's sort of just another FBX that isn't actually rendered directly, but used for that outline. Um, then we have, uh, of course, the growth animation. Then we have um, the physics part that is kind of the same as if it would be a piece of furniture, but it's just made with crystals. Uh, so the whole physics definition that defines like what happens and how does it crumble when you actually shoot it. And then really the state that tells you it's about to break is just a material change. It's not even a different 3D object. Um, but all of that, if you've done any game stuff, prefab uh, things, well, yeah, there's a prefab for the growing and a prefab for the destroying. You can place that in the game world, and they would do their thing um, according to those established rules. Now, that was great that we could get to this quite quickly. Um, and then there were first learnings coming from it. Like, we need to fit the metrics. Um, and they're not necessarily always obvious, but sometimes they are. Uh, platforms need to be flat and somewhat large. And it's quite surprising when you navigate a game world how, how large too small still is. Um, and uh, because the player is supposed to jump from, from place to place, and it's really frustrating if it's too small and lost. You slip off it, and then you fall, and you have to do it again, and you've got to hit the right, the right size there. Um, but because uh, 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 we, we could do this procedurally, it was very easy to try. And then, oh, okay, let's make it a bit bigger. Fine, it's a bit bigger. Um, the growth speed matters. Just imagine you're doing like a big jump, and then you go pull it out of the wall, and it goes and then it slowly starts creeping. And that, well, that's kind of frustrating, because you will have dropped by the time it's actually a place you can land. So that was quite important and need to be balanced a bit. Um, and the breaking state is quite important. You're standing on this thing. 
You just pull it out of the wall, you're standing on it, you're like, cool, where do I go next? You kind of need to know when it's about to break, because it's, again, kind of not awesome if it just breaks and you're like, well, thanks, I can go you know, all the way back up again just because um, I didn't notice that this will happen in the future. There's a lot of signaling that had to happen there. And then um, we started doing some animation tests. How does crystal grow? Usually very slow. Uh, but of course, it had to happen within seconds. Um, and uh, there were lots of iterations on that. So <laughs> all types of ways how things can spin into existence. Um, we decided uh, very early on that we're going to do um, sort of rigid body animation. It's not going to be a skin thing. Um, more like for tech reasons, it was quite difficult to uh, sort of develop this type of workflow um, uh, at that point in time because we didn't have any time. I actually don't know which one I need to point at, which is now the one that's in the game, but it's one of the ones that is a bit more organic, not fully regular um, of those videos. But we did explore some other stuff, and I just found those videos like, hey, it's kind of cool to see what else we just noodled with, and that's really just spending an afternoon throwing some stuff at something's growing, like a point cloud of growing things, um, cubes or more organic shapes, more like almost liquid, um, even more liquid. And, uh, but yeah, we, we just wanted to, or back then when I was doing that, I wanted to like, cross-check, is there really nothing else out there, or have you forgotten something? Is there an angle that we haven't really seen? Uh, but we stuck to what we initially had, because um, it was actually working quite well. Now, at that point in time, I was doing like crystal elaboration stuff, procedural things, but of course level design and environments had to already work. They had to plan out what does the world look like, or what does the traversal work, what's the flow uh, that happens in, in that world, and um, how that actually looked like is this. We, we started having this kind of cave environment, and these yellow crystals were already in there, and they could be used to do, well, to try things out, to design the space, to design what the player needs to do, how you travel through the space, how you're blocked, by you know, shoot, shooting a door or having to shoot one of those or destroy one of those crystal doors. And uh, that happened all in parallel. Now, at that point, it's actually quite strange to think about it, but at that point, we actually had now some time to think about how are they actually going to look like? Um, and uh, rightly so, people were saying, well, you know, that the yellow crystal stuff looks a bit World of Warcraft to us, right? And World of Warcraft doesn't really fit stylistically into what the control universe and the oldest house and the brutalist um, architecture is. Um, and uh, it seems counterintuitive to start this late with the visual development of it, uh, but we had to find those base metrics to unlock the other teams. And uh, yeah, they just had to build the world already because we only had four months and uh, we couldn't just wait until we found the real deal before they could actually be unleashed. So this was the window, and the good thing was because we're using procedural mechanisms, we, we could. We just changed the way the geometry is being generated, but the essence, the metrics, all that would stay the same. Um, so now we had this window, and we started, OK, what's the concept? What is the reference? Uh, we have this material called bismuth. That's the stuff on the right. Um, if you've ever played Control, it's quite, it has exactly those shapes, those uh, sort of repetitive step kind of uh, stuff going on. And then there was, I think this is some kind of sulfur-based thing on the left. Um, we were toying with those. Um, uh, but of course, it's always better to get concept art. So we had Oliver, um, a really awesomely talented uh, concept artist, to help us try to make up what this could actually look like. And you see, it's actually going quite a different direction than we initially might have thought. Um, put it into context, this is how it could look in the game world, and that was still very organic. And of course, that's difficult when everything is really smooth, but then you break it into bits that are really sharp and edgy. And um, So uh, that's now the first, OK, Jesse standing on something that comes out of the wall, and quite quickly, OK, cool, we have this in 3D. We can make this stuff uh, to be the crystal. And then from there, the journey, I'm shortening it a little bit for the uh, sake of time, but um, went on adding more detail. Uh, like sleeve meshes, tying it into the wall, materials, etc., and those things. And then we basically had the levels that were already built and had all this yellow stuff suddenly had all the green stuff, or sometimes both, as you can see here. Uh, um, so and that was really good. Of course, we had to add uh, particle effects when you shoot it and when they're breaking and to make it all sit nicely in the game world. Um, some challenges, just some sort of like, you know, it's not super smooth, you run into stuff that you're like, oh, what happens if there's a crystal growing, there's someone in the way, like an enemy, for example. So then you have like some weird collision thing happening you kind of have to deal with. And uh, we had, well, code to the rescue, really. Um, can the crystal push enemies, for example? Um, I think, yes, they can, and partially, uh, but also um, 
uh, what happens with, with items you put in the way, and we used that actually for puzzles that the crystals could push those little cubes. Uh, and that was a, a custom gameplay code that has been written to deal with all those cases um, that sometimes you only find when, uh, when you're actually doing it. Um, yeah, this is all that looks like some really early a crystal can push a thing, right? Uh, now, full production, essentially what I call their multiplication. Now, we've done a few things. Now, we need to do a lot of the things to cover all the cases that the game world contains and uh, just providing all the building blocks. And if someone goes like, hey, but I need one that is like this long or this tall or I'd hold something into place, what could we do there? Add more particle effects, work on the look and feel. Um, there's a shader being developed for that, how the crystal looks as a material to make it quite distinct from just the rocks and the walls and the solid surfaces that we had everywhere else and then playing with the puzzles and how do we do the rituals. So all those materials here is just a big test level where I plopped all the different um, uh, elements that we were using and tested them out. And uh, I'm going to just go through quite a few of them to show you the variations. Here are the spikes, for example. These are the spikes. Um, and you see in the background <laughs> piles and piles of different crystal elements and the rituals actually there uh, that uh, had to be made and tested. And but because they were all sort of made ex using exactly the same tool, it was quite easy to still iterate on almost all of them at the same time. Um, there's a caveat to that I'm going to get to in, in a, a bit later. And uh, yeah, so that's, for example, something well, you could use for a gate for a door, but you could also use as a platform to stand on. Um, and yeah, that's what I said is a shader test. Uh, that's an early test to just do something on the inside. I mean, this is assembly. There are enough people around that probably uh, know much more about shaders than I do, uh, but the, yeah, that's what, what it was supposed to do. There's a little, ray not even a ray marching, it's like a two-step parallax kind of thing going on on the inside to not be too expensive, to just give it a, a sort of like a special feel almost. This is like not your typical rock um, kind of thing. And let's talk about rituals. Uh, now, we settled on that there's six rituals in the game, puzzles to be solved, um, and the game was sort of non-linear in a fashion that you could decide, are you going for the growth ability first or the destroy ability first? So we had two puzzles around either of the abilities and then two puzzles that use both. Um, and that means we had to make six, but the player only sees four, depending on which way they are going. Um, but six puzzles means it has to be a bit more than everything is entirely handcrafted. and. Um, very early again, back to the yellow stuff. You can grow something, you can destroy something to create a geometric shape. And um, we settled on this um, also due to time. Um, and it's a very easily comprehensible thing that the player knows, OK, it needs to be a sphere. So I need to shoot stuff off and I need to pull, pull stuff out. And then you kind of know where to go. Um, so from a design perspective, it's, it's simple enough that you can actually handle making six of them um, in the time frame that we actually had. Yeah, and then that's kind of what it looks like with the actual treatment. Um, and uh, yeah, so you traverse, you can, you can jump and you can levitate around, and you have to pull those things out of the, uh, out of the shape to make the sphere. Um, I think, I hope I have another one. Maybe I don't, uh, where you have to shoot away the other bits, basically, to create this. And uh, that's how that looked like in the Houdini viewport. So I could go in and add those um, tentacles, basically, uh, uh, to that sphere that latches on to the surroundings. It's a bit like it's sort of mutating a bit. It loses its shape or uh, uh, it loses its sort of <laughs> perfectness. Um, and you have to bring it back into that state to create order, um, right? And uh, now this is black for some reason. Let me, let me try again. Well, that would be another ritual, but um, somehow it's black. So let's uh, continue. Um, now we used Houdini to make all this stuff, and um, uh, it's a tool used a lot uh, uh, to create well procedural content, procedural modeling, and uh, it was the proced procedural background for all the crystals. Uh, we had a set of digital assets, little nodes that you can pre-make, and then you plug something in, which is those curves that I described earlier, and they then generate this. Uh, the crystal shapes, but also the animation and everything else related. Um, all the data assets, metadata, physics, all that kind of stuff. And it wasn't entirely super crazy automated. Um, so in the end, every shape had to be, you have to draw the thing, and then you hook those curves into this node. And then usually it goes through, but sometimes it doesn't because something breaks, because uh, a procedural geometry creation always has a million fringe cases that you kind of have to handle. Um, so we had to run this through. Uh, 
And they're sort of, well, I've wrote it here, writing the thin line of perfecting a tool to cover all the cases and not breaking the bank on actually over-engineering this tool. And in the end, we were quite pragmatic um, because we had to get it done. So it was a bit like sometimes, well, I just quickly did it by hand instead of trying to fix the tool just to make sure we can hit the deadlines that we had. Um, yeah, it's struggling a bit showing the video, sadly. Uh, so, th well, not sure why that is. But uh, yeah, that would be a, a video that shows you the Houdini, the Houdini use. But the PowerPoint is eating my video, sadly. Actually, PowerPoint is entirely dying right now. I don't know what to do now. Um, let me try to get out of here. Mm -mm. Maybe I can jump to something later. Oh, yeah, it doesn't. Picture cannot be displayed. My apologies. Uh, well, I will have to continue like this from here, uh, out, of, out of my head, or I need to restart PowerPoint or something. How do I, how do I get back in edit mode? End the show. Oh, maybe I do it from here. Um, OK. Uh, how that looks in, in the game uh, is essentially that's how the, how the, how the ritual looks. Sorry about that, but you know, we've got to improvise. Um, uh, how that looks in game. So you have this. This is the 3D object coming out of it that you just saw in the Houdini viewport, and uh, yeah, you would be interacting with it. I think this is now uh, sort of in like God mode, flying around, just showing it from different angles and not in gameplay. Um, yeah, and that's the part that how it looked like in Houdini. Uh, so I could in the editor go in and sort of take those tentacles and manipulate them around and put them somewhere and those shapes around. I would sort of just put some placeholders in, but in the game world, we could actually put the uh, the actual crystal, um, uh, crystal, the, the astral plane blocks, those, those marble blocks, sort of, uh, to replace those placeholders here. And um, yeah, and that's fairly interactive. Sometimes the computation takes a couple of seconds, but uh, you can essentially go in and, uh, and, and change the, the shape of those uh, sort of tentacles that come out of places. And at some point, I can switch to, hey, what's the real mode? Because the preview had to be quite fast, and the real mode then always took a little bit longer. I think if I go to the end of the video, yeah, uh, basically, this is what it would actually look like, the geometry that I would export. Um, one other aspect, just another little procedural tool that we used there is we had some elements on the wall that were just showing crystal that wasn't actually interactive, and you could just make any shape you like, and it would sort of generate the crystal shape from that that we couldn't then just put in the game world. But that's not, that's not interactive by any means, it's just sort of there. And we only had a very limited set of those we used for dressing in the world. So how did it go? Well, I'd say quite well. I think the, the DLC was uh, well received. It really added something to the game world, like a sort of different um, aspect and angle to the normal, very strict geometry of the, of the oldest house, now having the sort of cave system to explore. We created a lot of content in a very short amount of time. Um, and I felt uh, we had this wonderful team uh, and we worked really well together to interweave sort of the design ideas and the gameplay the ideas and even narrative ideas into sort of what we could do on the art side with our procedural tools. And um, the crystals proved to be a great mechanism for that uh, because it was sort of repeating visual elements with a repeating sort of functionality. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, they uh, separated the DLC quite, DLC quite nicely from the gameplay of the of the main game and the visual pillars of the main game without breaking that, it's sort of just adding something to it. But of course, if you would have only had more time, of course you can take this much, much further, um, but that's, uh, that's just how it goes if you make a DLC. Now, what are the, what are the learnings? Do not over-engineer. Uh, rule number one, don't make it work always, make it work 80% of the time. Now, sadly, you've seen the next one already, because another learning is do not under-engineer. Um, because if you just wing it, because you think you only have to do this once, it usually means then you have to do it 427 times. Um, and if you would have only done it right from the start. So that is probably the hardest uh, thing to do from the start, uh, like figuring out how, what's the right path of 
doing it properly uh, instead of just making it up. Um, and that really is something where you, where you sometimes go wrong and sometimes you hit it right on the head. And trust is incredibly crucial. So, for example, the environment artist, level designer, placing those platforms in the world, um, they had to trust that whatever happens afterwards, whatever the metrics are they, are, they are still there. It can't be that suddenly everything not only looks different, but also works different. So that was really important that we trusted each other and, and the, the team was amazing to work with because somehow that, that really flowed quite well. Um, and we had this support along this entire chain from literally narrative, what does that even mean to grow stuff? Uh, what do we call it? Uh, and then of course the design, the flow of the game, the environment, art, and then what we could do in VFX and tech out at the top of that. Uh, and always like, Let's keep working on the procedural awareness because there's a lot of power in this that goes way beyond, oh, look, I can make a chair in 17 different sizes or something. It's really, there's a lot more to this rule-based um, uh, approach to things that can go way beyond just art by itself, but actually gameplay and level design. Um, so I don't know how much time I still have left. Uh, lost a bit of track. But where do we go from here? Um, well, we're working on the next projects, of course, already. Uh, and I know Control is already a little bit back, but that's the only stuff we can talk at the moment about. Uh, we are very busy working on Elm Wake 2. And uh, for not only that, but all the other upcoming projects, we're looking for VFX and tech artists. So if you want, there are some macaroons, branded macaroons somewhere later. Uh, and I will be around there if you want to, yeah, over there, the yellow guy who's waving. Um, if you want to have a chat about stuff, just come over. Uh, you don't need to want a job. You can just come and have a macaroon and still chat. Um, but if you're interested um, uh, in, I don't know, maybe working, working in this kind of stuff, uh, click the link or hook me up on LinkedIn or just talk to me and have a macaroon. And uh, I think there's a bit of time now to maybe also do some questions. Um, so if anyone has any, I really uh, can't see from up here. I, I can help you out. Okay. Johannes, well saved. <laughs> it's always a hassle with the technical difficulties, oh. but you did perfectly. Computers. <laughs> so, audience, I have the microphone. I will run it to you if I see you. <laughs> so if you please raise your hand if you have a question, and I'll, I'll come to you. Who is the brave one? You get an extra macaroon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Incentives, two macarons. But hey, if, if no questions at this point, Johannes will be here. So if we want to reach out and talk about like visual um, effects, and also, yeah, we actually talk briefly before the, uh, the talk that you know this is not the end of the uh, <laughs> FX, FX talk. So we definitely will be back next year with a bit different angle. Um, yeah, well, thanks a lot and thanks Thank for you. having me. Have a good day. Bye-bye.